Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome to uh, day four, night four of the College of the Atlantic Summer Institute. And um, tonight we're here with Allison Fundus and Bob Ballard, and we're super excited for that. But I've got a little story before that. Um, we, a few of us went out on a boat this afternoon to test that ropeless um, lobster gear. And it was wonderful. We were right out by Bear Island uh, near Seal Harbor. Um, and there was definitely that moment when Zach Cliver, who was a, an alum, like hit the come to the surface button. And we were all like, why isn't it coming to the surface? But it, it came up and it was wonderful. And the crowd on the boat, there were 25 of us like, ah, yes, it, it worked really remarkably. But the point is, um, on that boat, I, I started talking about um, Great Duck Island and Mount Desert Rock, which are the two research stations of the College of the Atlantic. And I called the chart a map in front of everyone. <laughs> and like, there was the hi that hissing sound from the, the whole boat. And like, I had to, oh man. Um, but I'm an anthropologist, right? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a professional novice and I like learning stuff, right? And I, what I've learned so far is, you know, the most important tool or one of the most important tools to come to grips with the ocean, to become a watered individual is the boat, right? The vessel. And uh, there's something really remarkable about spending time on a boat. And we're going to hear about a great boat tonight. But I think the point is life on a boat, especially over longer terms, is the ultimate practical user's guide to the root concepts of sustainability, right? It really is. You have to know where your water and food is coming and going from, your waste, energy, the social interactions that happen on a confined space. It's really, really remarkable. And a boat I'm really excited about and I wanted to um, tell you all about is just two hours ago, our 44-foot Seguin sailboat named Rebecca was launched in Southwest Harbor. Right, exciting, yeah. And this is, this is gonna be a new research vessel, uh, sailing vessel for, for the college, and it's named after Rebecca Clark, who I went to school with here and graduated in 94, but who died in the tsunami of 2004. So the boat is named in her honor, which is, which is really nice, um, yeah. I believe Rebecca will be actually on our dock um, by the end of the, the talk, and you can go by and check her out. Uh, but a person, I believe, who's going to become a mentor of mine in terms of my own journey with boats is Carolyn Gruby. And um, she's going to be introducing our speaker tonight. And Carolyn's an executive coach, an investor. Um, she's held executive positions with PayPal, Fannie Mae, and McKenzie and Company. But that is absolutely not why I asked her to come uh, introduce Bob and, um, and uh, Allison. But she and her husband, Chris, who are here, share this tremendous passion for the ocean. And I could feel it the first time I met these guys. Um, they're competitive sailors. Um, Carolyn's on the board of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, which is an extraordinary institution. Um, she's an, on the advisory council for Oceana, which we, we met Andy um, and Jackie before. And she's a board member of the Seaworthy Collective, which works with businesses and entrepreneurs to bring technological innovations to ocean solutions. So I'm very excited to welcome Carolyn Gruby to the stage. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much, Darren, um, for the honor of introducing our highly accomplished guests tonight and for participating in the College of the Atlantic Summer Institute, our one and only ocean. I split my time between Southwest Harbor here on MDI and Miami, two places where the ocean plays a significant role in the beauty and the economy of the area, albeit quite differently. As Darren said, my husband Chris and I are racing sailors. We've had Darren out racing with us and one day we forced him to grind the whole day, grind the sail in the whole day. And he, he did it brilliantly. Um, and recently we spent four years uh, cruising about halfway around the world on our boat. And the question we always get asked about our travels is, did it ever really get bad out there in the ocean? 
And luckily for us, the answer was no. But our guest tonight, Dr. Robert Ballard, who is currently the president of the Ocean Exploration Trust and the National Geographic Explorer, has spent his life exploring the ocean, including discovering voyages that did not go so well. He's conducted over 150 expeditions and found over 100 shipwrecks, I think more than anyone else in the world. He's best known for finding the Titanic on a trip we would later find out was financed by the US Navy to discover nuclear submarines. But he also discovered John F. Kennedy's patrol boat, the PT-109. He has discovered the deepest ancient shipwreck in the Mediterranean and also discovered hydrothermal vents. He's won numerous awards from the Explorers Club and from National Geographic, and the National Endowment for the Humanities Medal it was given to him by President Bush. He's a best-selling author. He's written many, many books, including his latest book, Into the Deep, about his lifetime of ocean exploration. I love Bob's attitude that the greatest discovery is the one he's about to make. And these days, he's putting his energy and discovering the next generation and mentoring the next generation of explorers who he believes will explore more of the Earth than all previous generations combined. And that next generation includes Allison Fundus, a 2003 graduate of our own College of the Atlantic and currently the Chief Operating Officer of the Ocean Exploration Trust and National Geographic Explorer. There, she leads teams of scientists engineers, educators, and storytellers to conduct annual missions aboard the organization's exploration vessel, which we'll hear more about tonight, the EV Nautilus, and to develop programs that bring those, bring those missions to youth and people around the world. She's led and participated over 50 expeditions, and among her recognitions in 2001, she was named one of 15 emerging explorers by National Geographic Society. A few years ago, Bob and Allison embarked on an ambitious quest to solve one of the 20th century's greatest mysteries, what happened to Amelia Earhart and her plane. Their ship, the EV Nautilus, is equipped with all the high-tech gear that's necessary to take on a challenging mission such as this. On co-leading this expedition with Allison, Bob said, I feel like Leakey handing this over to Jane Goodall. Both Bob and Allison are committed to making STEM and ocean exploration much more inclusive and equitable. We're so fortunate to have these incredibly accomplished explorers here with us today. I can't wait to hear their sea stories and about the critical work that they're doing to map the ocean floor. Let's welcome Bob and Allison. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, about 20 years ago, I was sitting on a very similar stage right here, graduating from College of the Atlantic. So it's really good to be home. Uh, I haven't been home here much uh, in those 20 years, uh, but I've certainly taken everything that I learned from COA, uh, the mentorship that I had, and I want to give a shout out to Chris Peterson. You're here, uh, one of the greatest mentors I've had in my life. Uh, he was my advisor here at COA. Um, and just the, the human ecology mindset, it really translates to everything that we do as explorers. Um, but it's been a great week so far. We're really excited to, to talk tonight um, and uh, tell you a little bit about our work in the deep sea and, of course, Bob's long and illustrious career uh, in discoveries. And um, I think we'll uh, kick it off, but we just really want to thank uh, College of the Atlantic, um, uh, Darren, Sean, Wes, everybody behind the Ocean Institute. Uh, this is a really incredible organization and a uh, wonderful group of people that you've brought together. Uh, and of course, thank you to all the Champlain Society members that, that make it possible and all of the donors and students and of course the community around here. So thanks for being here, but let's dig in. Um, so Bob, um, and we're just gonna treat this as a kind of fire talk conversation, although we don't want any fire tonight, it's a little warm. <laughs> One of my favorite stories about you, and just to set the stage a little bit, when I first heard the story about Bob, it, the kind of light bulb went off for me, because it was like, okay, this makes sense now. And this was a story that he tells in his book, um, but that I had heard before he first published it in his book. Um, and it's about uh, a story that his mom told him uh, when he was young. So Bob was a little adventurous, uh, and he could not sit still, he still can't, 
And um, well, so right. he, he would be exploring his backyard uh, in LA, uh, Downey, California. Um, and his mother could not keep him contained in the yard. So she had to physically tie him to the clothesline <laughs> to keep him in the yard. Where I've been working with Bob for almost 10 years, I sometimes feel like I wish I had that clothesline that I can tie him to. But I'm glad I don't because wherever he's going is going to be an exciting place. And I love following uh, him around and kind of helping to make his dreams come true. Uh, but Bob, maybe talk a little bit about you know, your upbringing. I know it had a huge impact on your life and what led uh, beyond that. Well, I, I was born in Wichita, Kansas, where all oceanographers come from. <laughs> uh, I just turned 80, so I was born six months after Pearl Harbor, and my father was building planes. He was an engineer in Wichita, and he packed up the family, my older brother, myself, and mom and dad, and off we went, and I woke up in the Mojave Desert. Uh, he was a test pilot with Chuck Yeager. And uh, then after the war, uh, a lot of vets said, why do I want to go back to Kansas or somewhere else? And we moved to San Diego. Uh, he went into aerospace. It was a, went on to become head of the Miniman Missile Program. So I lived in an aerospace company. It's sort of ironic that I would go the opposite direction. But uh, I just fell in love uh, with the ocean. Uh, we lived very close uh, in San Diego initially. Uh, uh, we were less than 100 yards away, and back in the old days, your parents would say, just be home before it's dark. And I would hop on my bicycle, and off I'd go to the tidal pools and learning the tides, and, and I just kept going. You know, I got involved, but I'm dyslexic, so I'm not a big reader. Uh, I never did read 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea until fairly recently because uh, I put it in dyslexic font and made it a lot easier, thank you. But anyway, uh, I went to see the movie. Uh, uh, Jules, uh, the Jules Verne movie was made in, by Walt Disney with uh, 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 Perry, uh, with Mace, uh, who was, let's see, uh, the, uh, Ned was the harpoonist and it was Kirk Douglas. And the captain uh, was, was James Mason, right? And so I came home from seeing that movie. Back in those days, we'd go to a matinee for 50 cents, and our parents would dump us at the show, and they'd take us all day watching it and eating popcorn. And I came home, and naturally, parents always ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I want to be Captain Nemo. And they didn't laugh, <laughs> like you did. <laughs> Uh, they, you should never laugh at a child's dreams, no matter how ridiculous it is. I'm sure they went in the other room and said, Houston, we have a problem here. <laughs> but they worked with me on Tell Me About Nemo. I said, a submarine. So they took me down to the sub base in San Diego. And then they said, well, it was more than a submarine. I said, yeah, it had windows. They took me to Scripps, which was just up the street. And so there's no surprise, I went on to become a naval officer for 30 years and an oceanographer just living my dream. People say, when are you going to retire? And I say, I've never gone to work a day in my life, so why should I stop now? So I became involved with National Geographic a half a century ago. I think I'm the, I, it, we're Alex, where I, uh, I beat you by a few years. My boss here, Alex Mullen is my boss at National Geographic. And I've watched the evolution of this society for 50 years, and it is at its peak. I've watched it change and change and change, and the National Geographic of today is the greatest that organization has ever been under Jill's leadership, and Mike, uh, Ulica, Alex, and, uh, and, and our new chief scientist, uh, Ian Miller. So, in fact, I took it beyond that. I married National Geographic. I met my, my wife to be at National Geographic. When I came back from the Titanic, there were 16,000 letters on my, my desk disappeared at Woods Hole. You couldn't see my desk. The mail department was furious, the switchboard was furious, but 16,000 letters that led me to create my educational outreach program. So. And that was the Titanic. And it's really funny, I gotta tell you, when you, and you, my book that I just did with National Geographic, and I also had to make it an audio, and I also had to make it in, uh, as a TV show. There's a, so go to Disney Plus, 
or, or get it in audio. And if you want to give it to someone that can read, give the book to them. But anyway, uh, <laughs> when when I got done with all, and begin, I'll give you a little taste of the uh, a, a prologue to the book. It begins with my mother. And so I had, when I came back from finding it, Titanic had me on the sh on the road, the Today Show, the Tomorrow Show, the Tonight Show, the one we haven't thought up yet. And I did this classic blitz. Oh, I call it waterboarding. But anyway, uh, <laughs> and I came back, and the phone rings, and it's my mom. Now, I'm 13th generation American, but the first to go to college with my brother and graduate. We were eight years Quakers, actually, and a lot of Kansans. And my mom's on the phone, and a brilliant woman. She was honor society in school in Wichita, but raised the family. And she said, it's too bad you found that rusty old boat. <laughs> You're a great scientist. You discovered hydrothermal vents, which rewrote the biology book. You discovered black smokers, which rewrote the chemistry book. You discovered and participated in the first exploration on plate tectonics to make it the law of the land. So you've rewritten three science textbooks, and now they're only going to remember you for that rusty old boat. <laughs> so moms are always right. So that's well, how it all began. And she wasn't off the mark, right? I no, mean, because I mean, you, you actually had some resistance from the academic community. Oh, I was hammered. You know what? I, uh, I, uh, but I had a great comeback. You ready for it? So I've, I've been in academia and naval intelligence at the same time for all my life. It's, that's an interesting. I can't talk about that other stuff. But anyway, <clears throat> so I've been hammered by academicians for, oh, and then here, so I'm walking down the hall after doing this, and this snooty, snooty colleague comes up and says, well, I now know what you do. I read all about you in National Geographic. And I said, well, I now know the journals you read. You miss the same thing in science and nature, <laughs> which are the two most prestigious journals. And we were on the cover of all three. OK, so, so yeah, I've, I've, but it's changed, quite honestly. I mean, but I still feel sorry for Carl Sagan for being denied entry into the academy by his jealous colleagues. Yeah. It's, it's dangerous. But I have learned the trick with National Geographic. Always have a co-author, so it's we. You get an imperial we. So it, may, it, it means academia. Science is not an I, it's a we. And so I've always insisted in my articles with National Geographic that it's a co-author and it's a we. And that's helped a little. <laughs> At least he liked it, the other author liked it. So you're clearly very well known for the Titanic and there's a lot of fanfare and there continues to be a lot of fanfare. What do you consider to be your most significant scientific discovery? Absolutely the discovery of hydrothermal vents. Can you imagine, uh, let's go, you know, here we are, look at these amazing creatures. This, they were not supposed to be there. Uh, normally when you go into the deep sea and you leave the sunlit layer, you come into almost a Martian-like environment in the mid-ocean ridge. The mid-ocean ridge is the largest mountain range on our planet. It covers 23 percent of the Earth's total surface area. Is this massive mountain range, 40,000 miles, 70,000 kilometer long continuous mountain range, and yet we went to the moon before we went to the largest feature of our own planet. But normally when you're down there, it's rugged terrain. It's where the Earth creates its outer crust, where the Earth bleeds its molten blood particularly if you're a believer of Gaia, which I am, that Earth is a creature. But then we stumble on these critters. And these guys are 13 feet tall. They have a pint of human-like blood. And we grabbed one of them. And the, what I love to do is there weren't any biologists. They turned us down. They said, well, it's just going to be a bunch of rocks. They missed the single greatest biological discovery by already thinking they knew it was there. So we pull out this tube worm and the blood, and we open it up, and they had giant clams a foot across that also had human-like blood. And when we dissected them, they had no internal organs. You know, it's not the clam and the half shell you're used to. You don't want to, this smells so bad. I mean, it's, and that was the key. When we opened the clams and we smelled them, they smelled like rotten eggs. 
And what we discovered that inside the bodies of these mega, mega organisms, these are 13 feet tall, foot across, was a bag full of bacterium, of primitive Archean bacterium that had figured out over eons of time how to duplicate photosynthesis in the dark. And this is where life began on our, we knew it began in the oceans, but we didn't know where, and so we found the, the, the site of the early me mega uh, fauna on our planet, and that's pretty good. <laughs> I think it toasts Titanic. So, my mom was right, <laughs> but I'm so glad I got to tell you that I'm actually a scientist. <laughs> Yeah, I would consider that pretty good. Um, we have some young students in the audience. I met Amelia and Cheyenne earlier. Um, the, this discovery fundamentally re rewrote textbooks. Yep. I mean, what, what is that like? And what, would you, what advice would you have for students, you know, thinking that everything is, is already known? Well, first place, just a quick comeback, which is just don't take it too seriously. When you're dyslexic, you don't like books anyway, so throwing them away was a lot of fun. But anyway, no, seriously. No, I think what's, uh, what I love about this whole process that we've been on and, and my relationship with you and all of the young people that have come before is, is every uh, new generation stands on the shoulders of the older generation and sees new horizons that we can't see, but they can. And in fact, I've just heard a wonderful speech by David Gergen who said, the, 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 the boomers need to hand it off. <laughs> you need to hand it, he actually apologized, I think he says, because he's one month older than I, or one month older, he was born in May of 42. And it's handing it off. And, and it's, it's something, we, it's hard to do, but we gotta do it, because each generation sees the world in a f totally different lens. And we need to let them run their world and, and, and back off. And so when I told the world that I was going to stand down uh, on January of this year. Bob just turned 80 if we want to wish him <laughs> a belated happy birthday. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I have different worlds. I have five worlds I live in. Uh, academia where I've been all my life at the at Woods Hole for 30 years and now it's graduate school oceanography and I had a professorship there in a big lab and I handed that off in January. Uh, I handed off my uh, military program to a wonderful young command, commander in naval intelligence and had handed that off. My wife runs our production company so that had already been handed off. You know. <laughs> And Allison, I just, as of what, yesterday, transferred the whole ball game of our, we just have a $200 million grant to conduct the second Lewis and Clark expedition to explore the 52% of our nation that lies beneath the sea, which we'll talk about in a minute. And I, I said, no, it's not the second Lewis and Clark expedition. We have every pronoun on our team, we have every face on our team, and 65, or is it now getting close to 70? Hovering between. Are women in positions of leadership and authority, so I call it the Lois and Clark expedition. <laughs> so. Well, and to land big grants like that, I mean, it's uh, a visionary like Bob that, that pulls it all together. Um, but he, you know, behind the scenes, what a lot of people don't know is all of the work that he does to, um, you know, get people excited on the Hill in Washington, D.C. And you've had an amazing career at convincing both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, that ocean exploration is critical for our nation and, and the world. What is the secret sauce? Never have them both in the room at the same time. <laughs> and have two totally different stories which are both true. Uh, so no, I, I uh, it's, how can it not be important? There is no plan B for the human race. We are not gonna leave this planet and go and live on Mars or some stupid place like that. We can't even terraform the Gobi Desert, so what do you think we're gonna terraform? There is no escape. 
that's important. There's no mess it up and run. And I, to kids, I say, think about it. Superman had his choice. He could have gone. He came here. Okay, so th we need to focus on our planet, which is taking us on. See, if you, I believe in the concept of Gaia, that Earth is a creature living symbios symbiotically with all of their life, codependent on one another, and we have one species that's gone off the reservation. And I'm convinced COVID is Earth's attempt to get rid of us. And we better come in to make a deal because we're not going to win that battle. We need to cut a deal with the Earth and all other life and get back where we are in this integrated ecosystem. And we're, again, off the reservation. And some of us are not betting, uh, are betting that the human race will not survive this, this century. 2050 when we hit the real wall, when there isn't enough food to feed the 10.8 billion people. We're, we're in deep doo-doo, okay? I hate to be doom and gloom, but I'm an optimist in that there are solutions. We, we will prevail, but we have to come back into balance with our planet, and we're not in balance right now. So, yeah. Other than that, it was a great day. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to transition here, but... Um, <laughs> Optimistically, that's your job, Allison. I'm the doom and gloom guy. <laughs> well, and that's where we really come in, right? So we really do try to bring a lot of optimism uh, to ocean exploration. So I'm just, I'm going to take a little, a couple of minutes just to talk a little bit about what we do uh, with our nonprofit, the Ocean Exploration Trust, which Bob founded in 2008. Um, so it's founded in, in Connecticut as a 501c3, um, and this is our ship. So this is kind of the keystone of our program. This is EV, or Exploration Vessel Nautilus. It is the only ship in the world with the class EV, um, and that was very creative naming on, on Bob's part. Um, but our mission is really threefold, and that is to make new discoveries in biology, geology, chemistry, maritime archaeology, to push innovation, to do ocean exploration more effectively and more efficiently. And then just as important to both of those missions is our education and outreach program. Uh, so we do a lot with educators. We bring educators on all of our expeditions. We run internship programs. We treat our ship very much like a training ship. We have interns on board at any given time. And we stream everything that we do live. We provide all of our data open access to anybody that wants it. Um, so we are very open with our exploration. Uh, we really want to draw people in. We're not trying to turn everybody into an oceanographer by any means. Uh, but we really want people to be at least lifelong interested in the ocean, ocean health, uh, and certainly STEM uh, vocational careers uh, that come out of what we do. STEAM, yes. Yes, we are in the STEAM. Um, so our, our kind of bread and butter uh, with our ship is uh, conducting seafloor mapping expeditions uh, and then we also have robotic vehicles that are uncrewed um, that are called remotely operated vehicles. So you can see that uh, vehicle in the wa water tethered to the ship in this image. Um, the main, uh, our main uh, mission in this is to really fill in knowledge gaps. Um, so I, this is a little challenging to make out if you're not used to looking at a map projection like this. Uh, but this is the map of the ocean. So it's laid flat so you can see all of the world's ocean all at once. It's equal area. So it's not distorted by right. Mercator projection. And so what, what this is showing you are, are areas of the ocean that are mapped in high resolution uh, and areas that have not been mapped at high resolution and we likely only have uh, data that's inferred from satellite data. So in the light blue, and you can see so you can see a lot of track lines where ships have clearly traveled, uh, those are the areas that have been mapped uh, in, in high resolution, and the darker blue uh, are, are knowledge gaps. We have not mapped those areas. So only about 20% of the world's ocean uh, has been mapped at the resolution that we really want these maps to be at, and the international community wants them to be at. So we are part of an international uh, collaboration. It's called Seabed 2030. Um, just we've been hearing a lot about uh, goals for 2030, but one of the goals in our field is to have the world's ocean fully mapped at high resolution by 2030. Um, so everywhere we take our ship, 
up, we make sure that we're prioritizing areas that nobody else has been before. And the majority of our funding, um, sorry, these aren't advancing very, hmm? oh, oh. <laughs> sorry, I knew this was gonna happen. The majority of our funding uh, is, uh, comes from federal grants, um, and that's largely with NOAA. Uh, through the Office of uh, Ocean Exploration, and we also work with the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries from time to time. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> Hard to talk and go. trying to chew gum and everything. Okay. Um, so uh, a lot of our, our grants are federally funded through NOAA, um, and so we are primarily focused on the U.S. exclusive economic zone right now. And if you're not familiar with that, Exclusive economic zone is 200 nautical miles from the country's coastline. So every country that has coastline has jurisdiction over those 200 nautical miles. The U.S. has the second lar largest EEZ, or exclusive economic zone, uh, in the world, second only to France. Um, and in this map, this is showing you a more detailed view of what's mapped and not mapped in our own EEZ, and if you're from the U.S., uh, so that the light pink area are, is unmapped areas uh, in deep water, so that's deeper than 200 meters. The uh, darker red is shallow region that is unmapped, so that's shallower than 200 meters. And anything that's in the light blue are areas that have been mapped. So you can see along the east coast, um, pretty well mapped in the deep water, a lot of shallower water left to map. But we're focused on the deep water, and so if you're looking where those gaps are, uh, you can pretty quickly figure out where, where we're going to be spending a lot of our time, uh, and that's largely in the Central Pacific, which we'll talk a little bit about. Oh, this is going to get me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, so uh, with our ship, um, we, we have a sonar uh, mounted on, on the hull of the ship. So it's able to map when it's um, underway. As, and so the way that we map is by sending multiple pings down to the seafloor, and then a transducer on the hull of the ship waits for that sound signal to return. And based on the time of return, we can measure the depth of the seafloor. We know how many pings we send out, how they come back, and then we can ultimately use that data to create maps like this of the terrain of the seafloor in high resolution. And it's not flat. <laughs> and then more recently, uh, we are trying to do a lot more than our ship will do on its own. I might have to do this without slides soon. I think the just, clicker is broken. We just love showing you our maps. Yeah. Can you advance it for me, maybe? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, so this, uh, we're, so we're looking for some force mul multipliers in, in our game. So we want to be able to be a lot more efficient when we're out there. It's not cheap to run a ship like ours. So we want to make the best use, especially if it's your tax dollars, we want to make the best use of that time when we're out there. So while we're mapping with our ship, we want to be able to deploy one, two, three autonomous vehicles that we can send out and map uh, concurrently while we're doing operations as well. So this vehicle um, is a brand new vehicle. Uh, this is the first commercially uh, given or uh, sold vehicle. It was uh, developed by a company in France called Xblue. Uh, and this is through a partner, our partnership with uh, University of New Hampshire and NOAA. And so this vehicle uh, is capable right now of mapping up to depths of 500 meters. And in just a few months, uh, we're going to increase its capability to 3,000 meters. So we are going to have this vehicle out with us. And while we're mapping and exploring the deep sea, it's going to be off on its own mission for up to seven days without us having to recover it. In fact, it. it's, it's out there this very second doing exactly yeah. this at our nautiluslive.org. So not now. Don't look at it. But that <laughs> puppy's at work yeah. right now. So it is, it's a great way just to, to make ourselves a lot more efficient in, in what we do. And we'll advance to the next, sorry. Um, so once we have these maps, we want to get a much closer look. Uh, and to do that, we use our remotely operated vehicles, or ROVs. And this is our main ROV. This is ROV Hercules. Um, and as you can maybe see uh, on the front of it, it's outfitted with two manipulator arms. And so we're able to control this vehicle, empower it, and communicate it with it from the ship. So the pilots sit on the ship, the scientists sit on the ship, nobody goes down. This thing can stay down for as long as we want it to until we have so many samples, we just need to bring it back. 
Um, so it's outfitted with uh, high definition cameras, 4K cameras, and so we're able to send it to the depths and uh, sample and create some really stunning, stunning visuals. Well, advance. Um, so this is uh, an example of, of what it looks like when it's down. Um, so you can see the, the manipulator arm reaching it, out. It has a companion vehicle. It does, this, it does. Uh, so this is taking the picture, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it, it's, um, you know, it really gives us eye on the seafloor, and so we're able to ground truth all those high-resolution maps that we're making. Well, I think and so we're, uh, and through this work, uh, we're, we're mostly looking at biodiversity. Um, so again, we're exploring areas that have not been explored before. So we might be within uh, the boundary of a monument or a marine protected area or just outside. And so we're really um, creating a, a better understanding of baseline data for, for what exists in a place. So who lives there? How do they interact with one another? Um, and you know what what species ranges um, can can we infer from the the general area that that we're covering? Go one more. And while we're doing this, we're streaming it all live. Um, so anytime our vehicles are underwater, uh, we have a team of eight people uh, instructing uh, the pilots and uh, directing that dive but they're talking out uh, over publicly accessible video that any student, any researcher, any member of the public can tune in and watch and participate right along with us. And so we make it a very participatory process. We not only wanna give people a look over our shoulder as we're in the process of exploration and discovery, uh, but we wanna engage in the conversation. So we take questions and we, we answer thousands and thousands of questions uh, every year when we're out there uh, as people are joining up with us. So it's, it's a pretty exciting time. Um, so as I said, we're, we're, gonna sp we're spending the, the majority of our time in the Central Pacific. Um, we, are, we have been spending uh, quite a bit of time in the Papahano Mukuakea Marine National Monument, which uh, was first uh, created by George W. Bush and then it later expanded by Obama. Um, so that has been a really fantastic um, series of explorations in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. And then more recently, we've been working a lot in the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument. Um, and the shaded areas there um, are areas that are the protected areas within those monuments uh, within the, the exclusive economic zone. And then eventually we'll, we'll make it down to American Samoa and, and out to Guam, uh, but we've got a lot of ground to cover still. Um, and I want to just show you a sneak peek of um, something that we just recently discovered. Um, I, I'm just a week off the boat. Uh, I just got back from a month at Johnston Atoll, uh, where we were exploring uh, seamounts within that entire exclusive economic zone. Um, and we, we came across, uh, we were exploring, a, if you can skip to the video, that would be great. Um, if we were exploring a variety of seamounts uh, within the EEZ, and then there's a bunch of geos, so uh, seamounts that were once above surface had erosional, so they have flat tops. Um, but we were really um, having, you can maybe hit play. Oh, no. Can it play? <laughs> Aloha, my kako. Sorry. One more. Yeah. Sorry, guys. It's dark down there. <laughs> there we go. Um, it's not running. It is now. Oh. Uh, it should run. Uh, Aloha don't my hit anything. No. Once you it's, start it's that okay. It's okay. It's really cool, <laughs> I promise. I but anyway, so we were we were at Johnston Atoll, um, and we came across this uh, really incredible sea pen, which is a relative of a coral. It was about two meters high. We'll try to get the video up uh, of that at, at some point during this. Um, but it was the first sighting of this particular sea pen in the Pacific ever. It was known in the Atlantic and Indian Ocean, uh, but had never before seen, uh, been seen in, in the uh, Pacific. So uh, let's exciting. just pause for a second. Yeah. Can you try to go back to that? That is such as, yeah, let that roll and then all hands off the stick. It's not rolling. It rolled at rehearsal. Sometimes you hit it with a hammer and it works really. So it's it's not rolling, huh? It was when yeah. we when we did rehearsal. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll find it. We'll send it to you. It's spectacular. It's, it's online at nautiluslive.org. Yeah. It was so, also so in the New York Times recently. Yeah. Well. yeah. 
Um, but, but while we're in the Pacific, um, you know, we are, we are very mindful of where we are. Uh, and, you know, as Bob kind of teed up earlier, it's really important to us that we are, you know, uh, doing all of our expeditions ethically. Um, so we've been doing a lot, a lot of work uh, within the Pacific Islands that we've been working in. So that's pr pr primarily been Hawaii uh, recently. So we've been working with the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. They have uh, a group called the uh, Cultural Working Group. And so this, uh, these are representatives from all over uh, Hawaii. And they, we've been working with them to ensure that we are incorporating Hawaiian worldview into our expeditions and uh, Native Hawaiians into all, all of our expeditions. And so we've been doing um, a lot of partnership. We've been kind of a lot, especially when the, within the education and outreach side of things. Um, so language revitalization is, of course, really important in, in Hawaii. Um, and we, we heard that from them and we listened to them uh, on that. And so we do live interactions from our ship uh, to classrooms all over the world. So if you are interested in this, we can, anybody can sign up for those. Um, but we started do, doing them in Olelo, Hawaii, so Hawaiian language, um, into 13 language uh, immersion schools around Hawaii. Uh, it was fantastic. We've been building a lot of our outreach products in Olelo, Hawaii as well. Um, and then we have, uh, on all of our expeditions in the area, we have local interns, local educators, uh, and cultural uh, liaisons on board with us, just so we make sure that as we're doing our very kind of Western-minded science, that we're very cognizant um, that there is another view um, that, that, is, that needs to be brought to these expeditions. Yeah, so we can skip to the next uh, video. And this, this is, I'm just gonna show you a little example um, of one of the outreach product products. Uh, this is one of the educators uh, that sailed with us um, on one of our recent expeditions to Papahano, Nukuakea. I am currently on the EV Nautilus, a exploration vessel. And on this vessel, I am a science communication fellow. In Olelo Hawaii, that would be a kumuao or a mea haimo olelo. Aloha. As the EV Nautilus journeys through the waters of Papahana Mokuakea Marine National Monument, let's learn some words in Olelo Hawaii, the Hawaiian language. Starting with Papahana Mokuakea. The name Papahana Mokuakea comes from Papahana Moku and Wakea, two honored and highly recognized ancestors of Native Hawaiian people. Let's say it together. Repeat after me. Papa, Hano, Moku, and Akea. Papa Hano Moku Akea. My kai. Let's learn some more Huo'olelo or words for things in the ocean. Please give it in a shot. In the Hawaiian language, there are many names for different parts of the ocean. One name for the deep ocean is Moana. Within the Moana, there are many different organisms such as koa, coral, huakai, sponge, he'e, octopus, yi'a, fish, pe'a, sea star, papai, crab, pololia, jellyfish, and okala, anemone. Across the Pacific, the seafloor has many seamounts or underwater mountains. Mauna means mountain and kai means ocean. Mauna kai is a sea mount. Other geology terms include Mauna kai pa lahalaha, gio or sea mount with a flat top, lua pele, volcano, kualapa or kualono, ridge, pali, cliff, auwaha, trench, pohaku, rocks, Mokupuni, island. A Hawaiian word for an expedition is huaka'i, a journey of discovery. For a ship, the huaka'i is made possible through lo lima, meaning many hands working together, or cooperation. Here are a few words that help describe how OET explores with both tools and teamwork. Moku, ship. Mikini mokulu'u, ROV. Alakai, expedition leader. Hoe epekema, scientists. Kumu, educator. Pailaka, ROV pilots. Haumana, student. Okay, quiz time. Can you describe what's shown here? Mikini mokulu'u, 
ROV. Who a kai? Sponge. Can you describe what's shown here? Koa, coral. Pea, sea star. Huakai, sponge. My kai, good job, and mahalo for listening. Keep practicing and keep learning as we continue our journey through the deep sea. <laughs> I'm actually part Polynesian, and I can sing a pearly shells in Hawaiian, but I'm not going to do it right now. Definitely. Need a couple dark and stormies. So that's just a, a small example of what we're doing, um, but just wanted to, to share that with you all. But taking a, taking a step back. <laughs> taking a step back, you had a vision for all of us a long time ago. In 1981, you published the uh, picture in National Geographic of telepresence and which nobody had even thought of you know that that happening you want to talk a little bit about your vision and well again I I don't know if you know much about us dyslexics but we are gifted and we see the world very differently and we're wired differently our brains are physically different and we tend to see things that other people don't see in fact in the world of dyslexia 65% of all self-made millionaires are dyslexic because we think out of the box. The key to being a successful dyslexic is to think out of the box and then hand it to a non-dyslexic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I just had this vision when I was at Stanford, I was on sabbatical, of having spent a lifetime going up and down in a yo-yo called a deep submersible. Uh, to get down to the Titanic, which is the average depth of the ocean at 12,000 feet, it took me two and a half hours to get to work in the morning, two and a half hours to get home at night. When I dove 20,000 feet, it was six hours to get to work, six hours to get home, minutes on the bottom. So the idea that came into my mind that I published 41 years ago, 41 years ago, I came up with this idea. You'd think we'd get a little sooner than now, but anyway, uh, published it in the magazine and then worked systematically to scale that mountain and we're here and the idea is to move your spirit your spirit is indestructible that can move at the speed of light so we have out-of-body experiences literally beam me down Scotty's and that's what's so wonderful about it because we can beam anyone down and when we take kids Allison showed those beautiful pictures. You should have heard what the scientists were saying because when we make discoveries, they, they become middle schoolers and they start saying, wow, that becomes a scientific term. You gotta go to our gallery. When we come in on a discovery, the scientists just melt into middle school kids and that's such an important message to send kids. I never grew up, I'm still in middle school. So it's being able to, tr bring that technology online. And I tell the present generation that their generation in school right now will explore more of America and the world's oceans than all previous generations combined. We are just at the beginning of the great era of exploring the oceans. Not in our history books, in our middle schools right now are those explorers. It's a really nice segue into my next tee up, and that's, uh, you know, I think you've been inspiring to so many people. I mean, how many people here have been inspired by Bob, right? Um, and that is probably equally important to you as the many discoveries that, that you've made over the years. More important. Yes. Yeah. Um, why, why is it so important to you? Yeah, I, because I, I struggled all along with my dyslexia, and yet I got to the top of the mountain because of people that saw something in this kid from Kansas and took me under their wake. That's why God gives us tear ducts. <laughs> Do you want to talk a little bit about, or do you want me to give you a moment? Look at this. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> okay. 
Look at those faces. So I'll, I'll cue this up, and you can you can jump in when, when you're ready. When I recover. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with with our ship, uh, you know, we we really anybody that steps on board Nautilus uh, signs up to be a role model, um, and so we really want to ensure that any child that's watching us, that sees us, that comes across, you know, a potential profession that they're interested in, can see themselves in somebody on the ship. Um, not everybody has to be a PhD, as Bob uh, says. If the ship was full of PhDs, uh, it we, would we go run aground. So, <laughs> da Darren, I don't know if that was the the problem. It probably, pro <laughs> but, probably was. Too um, many cooks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I, I think you know that this these are these are all individuals that have sailed with us, um, and so we we really want to make sure. Uh, so we profile them. Everybody has a biography on our website. How did you get here? What was your path? You know, who inspired you? What what advice would you have? Um, so if somebody uh, upper right hand corner <laughs> two in is my daughter Emily Rose with a button nose. Over on the left hand side, top row five over is Benjamoni Macaroni. That's my son. All my children have all sailed with me and said, saw the business, great, I got to get a job. But anyway, my son is now in cybersecurity, and my daughter Emily Rose is in Hollywood in her dream job at myth myth Mythical Productions. So it's all about dreaming and making your dreams come true. And it's, again, with National Geographic, think about it, uh, uh, Alexander Graham Bell uh, was dyslexic. And they've now linked up with the Disney Corporation, and Walt Disney was dyslexic. <laughs> I think I've made my point. <laughs> so the, the other part of this equation, too, uh, you know, making sure that we've got role models is we want to make sure we've got inroads, that, that people have a pathway into STEM and if they want to get engaged. Uh, so that's where some of the opportunities that we create, whether it's an internship, uh, we have five flavors of internship on our on, our, on, our, on board, um, and that's ocean science, seafloor mapping, ROV engineering, filmmaking, and storytelling, and navigation. So you know, very uh, variety of fields. Uh, we have program for educators, so that's formal, informal educators. Uh, with artists fall under that category. Uh, children's book authors have sailed with us under that category. Um, and we, so we bring three educators on every single one of our expeditions as science communication fellows. One on every watch. And they, they help us distill the pretty complex uh, stories that we often have to tell in science and engineering back to their students and their public. And, and our goal in that is we give a teacher an amazing experience. How many lives are they going to enrich after that? Because you know, they're going to carry that experience back with them for you know, decades of, of students, hopefully. So that, that's what the, the education program is that, that we've really built, which is where my heart is. <laughs> that's great. Oh. Uh, yes. So we're going we're gonna to segue into what's next. Um, a lot of you might not know this about Bob, but you know, he'll say it's part of his dyslexia, but he is always five steps ahead. You know, I prefer to wear flats, but I definitely always wear flats with Bob because you could just cannot, Tennis shoes generally. Not, can't, you cannot <laughs> keep up with him physically or mentally. It is, um, he is, he's always on the next thing. He is a true visionary uh, in every sense. Um, but I'm going to hand it over to you. What, what's next? Well, I'm uh, one of the founding fathers and, and, and mothers of the, the, Nash, uh, the, uh, the uh, National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. I'm. I grew up in the parks. I. I, because again, I was always on the run. My parents sent me to Yellowstone. You'll see. I fell in love with the park system. That's where I spent all my summers walking around. And I. I got involved early in the creation of underwater marine sanctuaries. As as uh, Brian Scary mentioned, they are the nurseries out of which life. Uh, can can emerge, so we need to have areas to protect the species of the world. Uh, as, and as also as Sylvia says, it's amazing how resilient life can be, but it has to not be extinct. So the important part of these marine sanctuaries, and as you know, uh, the President Biden, one of the first executive orders he sent, 30 by 30, 30% 30 by 2030. Uh, our job is to get in ahead and find out what's in, in in our country. Uh, 
I mean, I'm a strong advocate is don't create a sanctuary until you know what's in it. So we're constantly trying to stay ahead of it. But so we're working in the US EEZ in the marine sanctuaries, but we're now teaming up with, what's really cool about National Geographic is it has these great explorers that we, we know of one another, uh, but we never, you know, worlds cross, but then Geographic makes a critical mistake every June and brings us all together. And then we hatch things. And I got to, when Enrique and I said, so Enrique, where are you going? Let's go to the next slide. Enrique says, well, this is where I'm gonna be working in international waters and, and other countries to create marine sanctuaries. And I said, Enrique, that's where I am. Why don't we scare the hell out of Geographic and team up and, and combine the power of our technology. We're obviously a very high tech driven capability. And so we said, Enrique, before you jump in the water and some of these, let us go in. I think you have this slide, right? That shows our technology. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go in ahead of Enrique. Uh, we're, uh, uh, it was gonna be what, when's the Marshall Islands, August? Enrique wants to go to the Marshall Islands, and he's, well, I don't know, are we supposed to talk public about this? Or did he give us, am I okay on this, or should I I'm looking I at Alex. Okay. <laughs> uh, some set of islands, I can't remember their name, but anyway. But, is there anyone here for the press? I'm, I'm, I'm delirious. But anyway, the idea is to go into the coral reefs of the world, which as you know are under deep duress through acidification of the water and to global warming and to go in ahead of him with our powerful technology and map the entire coral reef system before he jumps into the water. Then we're working with Ved, say his name, I can't say it. What? Sure, yeah. Thank you. I, I took a long time to learn Papahana Umul Kaab. I'll get Ved's name soon. But Ved is a, a brilliant scientist at NASA who's now at the University of Miami, and he developed a fluid lens that he can put on drones that removes the refraction of waves and makes it transparent. So what we're going to be doing is going in with the, with the, the Drex vehicle, making this three-dimensional uh, characterization of the coral reefs, and then superimpose upon them the, the imagery, and then through machine learning uh, work uh, to identify all the species of everything, and then give Enrique the map, jumps in the water both uh, with scuba diving or even deeper with his new, uh, new submarine, and is able to then ground truth it. So we're teaming up together. If any of you want to go, let us know. We have a beautiful VIP suites on our ship. We can only take four people. Uh, but Kara, is Kara here somewhere? Kara, there, back of the room, see that young lady? In the, if you want to go with Enrique and I on a, an adventure of a lifetime, in a nice adventure, and I have a very good wine cellar, but anyway, you want to talk to Kara. And so uh, be able to imagine taking on the coral reefs, because we're finding that corals are, are actually getting smart. Uh, they always were. One is that there's some are developing like COVID variants that are more heat resistance, and, and they're also on the move. They're moving out of the, the, uh, the heavily uh, hot waters of the tropics into the subtropics with their larvae, about 14 kilometers a year towards each pole. They're, so they're on the move. So our job is can we find a place they want to go? And so this is really going to be a lot of fun because we're really going to bore in on uh, the health and well-being of, of the world's coral reefs and see if we can help them out, uh, help them be able to get to places they want to get. So again, this will start next year. And I said you were going to be five years ahead, but <laughs> we'll, well, we'll make it happen in one. <laughs> well, we'll do it next year, too. I've been thinking about it for five <laughs> years, but anyway, okay. So anyway, that's a cool program. To, to link up with Enrique and his Pristine Seas program, which is amazing. I yeah. love it. That is, that is. Well, I think we're, we're pretty close to having to uh, open it up to uh, Q&A for the audience. But before we do that, you know, we always want to kind of probably close with a little bit of a call to action. Um, and so I guess, you know, what, what do you hope that people leave here with? You know, what, what do you want people to know about ocean exploration and the deep sea? 
it's a creature, it's alive, it's, it needs us to get back on the reservation. Uh, it will survive. Do not worry about Earth being around in billions of years. It's a teenager. Uh, in plate tectonics, the Earth's got many billions of years to go. Life will always be on this planet, so don't worry about life. Are we going to be here? worry deep about that and you need to look at your carbon footprint i calculated my carbon footprint and my family and all my and i you can do it and go online and calculate and i s said i'm going to do a hundred of me and i did it by in my world in my community 70 percent of all our forests in the town of lyme are in nature conservancy and then we preserve the wetlands they're great sequesters so do, don't talk about someone else doing something. Get off your butt and do it yourself. So I think that's what's really critical. It's, we're going to make it, but only if we get together on this. That's my message. That's great, Bob. Well, it's been a blast being up here with you. Thank you all. Uh, and I think we'll uh, open it up for, for questions. Do we need to give up our mics, or do you have extra mics? No, I'll make my way around. Just raise your hands if you'd like. Well, we can pass. We'll share one. <laughs> We're in the chair. Here, why don't you take this one? There we go. All right, question time. How about right here in front? How has climate change affect your, affected your research? I got it, Bob. Yeah. How, how has climate change affected your research? Well, in some ways we're lucky in the great depths because water is an amazing pro has amazing properties. It has an oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. And as water gets cold, the, the two, uh, the, the whole molecules called Brownian motion vibrations go down and down and down until it hits a magic temperature. At four degrees centigrade, those two positive atoms repel one another and water, uh, 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 H2O expands. And that's why there's life on the bottom of the Great Lakes and, and the, in the Canadians Lake, because it, it freezes from the top down, not from the bottom up. And so what we're, what's really amazing is how that, in the deep sea, most of the water that you're staring at in that picture is tens of thousands of years old and came from the polar regions and fell down there through gravity, through the polar circulation, Antarctic circulation system. So fortunately, they're in really, really old water that we haven't mucked up yet. But what you also, what we do see is the the bad guy on the block is the plastics. But of the, that's mostly up in the in the surface area in the Euphotic. The turtles think it's a, a, a food. So most of the damage really is being done in the coastal regions and the sh in the upper layers. As, as uh, uh, Brian Scary said yesterday, we have hunted down and killed 90% of all of the large fish in the sea. We have yet to flip from hunter-gather. 12,000 years ago, we flipped and started cultivating crops and domesticating animals, and we moved away from hunter-gatherer society to, to, to farming and herding, and the city-state evolved, and here we are. We are still in a very primitive state of going out and killing the lions and tigers and bears, like shark fin soup. I'm glad they were gonna finally add the word shark on the menu to the fin soup, that they discard the rest of the shark after they cut his fin off. So I think what we, what we need to realize is that, is that uh, the, the, it's really the near shore areas that are getting hammered extremely hard. The loss of the mangroves, oh my God, that's a huge loss. The loss of wetlands. Uh, so most of the, we're lucky that, quite honestly, because 
we're going where no one has ever been before. Seldom we see a beer can down there. And, and uh, we make sure we, it's never one of ours. I mean, we make sure that we never throw anything over the side of the ship. But we're lucky to be able to have the pleasure and honor, thanks to you taxpayers, to go where no one has ever gone before. And you never get tired of that. <laughs> and you're going to go with us one day, right, young lady? So I want you to be a, one of our members of our team. And Allison will tell you exactly how to do it. We start taking, what, 15? You have to be 15 because we have this insurance company. <laughs> so anyway. Yes, another hand up there. Can the right do, the left do better than the right? There we go. Thank you so much for your work. Can you talk a little bit about where you see fisheries going? Um, I imagine with your work that you see a lot of destruction um, from the fisheries and from the dredging and the gear loss. Um, and I just wonder. We got to go to uh, farming. And, 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 and uh, uh, there's an aquaculture talk tomorrow. One of my favorite, uh, I did a TV show a series with National Geographic called Alien Deep, and we talked about a really cool program you want to look at because it gives me great hope. It's called the Valella Project. Go to YouTube, V-E-L-L-E-L-A. And it's an Australian uh, aquaculturist who took a carnivore. Uh, it's called Kampachi or Hamachi in Hawaii. It's, you buy it when you go to a sushi restaurant called Yellowtail Sushi. It's expensive. It's $17.50 a pound. And it's a carnivore. It's a reef carnivore, so it's an apex animal at the top of the, and you don't want to eat apex animals because it's, you, you, you go through too many trophic levels of inefficiency to fix car, fix protein. You want to eat, like, we eat animals that eat grass, chickens, pigs, cattle, and on the list goes. You want to eat things that are at the lowest level of, of herbivores. The sun, come, the energy comes from the sun, fixes carbon and grass, and eats the grass, then you eat that. You want to be eating herbivores. So they had an interesting conversation with this fish. And off Hawaii, on the Kona side, they set up uh, an offshore uh, aquaculture program. And what they did is really clever. Uh, Kona, uh, like the Hawaiian Islands, it looks like a ship going through the ocean, but it's the ocean going through the island. And they have big eddies behind it, like you would behind a boat. So with a NASA satellite, they can see the eddy. So they go out to where the eddy is, and they build this big cage, of, of, uh, uh, which won't biodegrade. And they put these fingerlings in it, and they say to the fish, so here's the kid, here, kids, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to put you down at 90 feet so no one runs over you. We're going to put you in the eddy, and we're going to feed you soybean. We're going to flip you to a herbivore. Eat it or die. And you know that fish was smart enough to go, got it. And they bring it up, feed it, put it back down, and in five months they bring it to market. And, and it's scalable because it's in water that has nothing in it. You know, when you go to the tropics and you say, it's gorgeous, isn't it? Yeah, there's nothing in the water because as water gets warm, it boils off the nutrients. Why are we got so much productivity out here? Why is it green? Because it's full of stuff. So all the major fisheries of the world are in the high latitudes north and south of the equator. So they are now going into an area that produces nothing, almost sterile water, Think of the scalability of it. And they just got a big permit to do it in the Gulf of Mexico. But this open ocean aquaculture is so scalable. And I had uh, Neil, I said, Neil, oh, I love sushi, so, but I be careful on what sushi I eat. I don't eat tuna. Uh, but anyway, I said, would you send me several of these fish as soon as they're ready for market? and FedEx them to me with some ice, and I'm going to have a party, and I'm going to have a taste-off, and I'm going to have yours and what you get at the suit. And everyone loved the one. They didn't know. So it was absolutely wonderful, but it had been converted into a herbivore. Now they're moving away from feeding it soybean because we're losing our farmland. You want to see a frightful movie, go to YouTube called Kiss the Ground on the loss of our topsoil. 
and the prediction that we have 60 harvests left in our farmlands before they belly up. 60 harvests, that's 60 years. We lose all our time. Why is the Mississippi brown? That's the, that's the soil going down the river. A million metric tons a day of our soil goes out to sea. And so we need to do new farming practices. We're just going to run out of farmland. We're building houses on them, and we're, and we're throwing the dirt in the, in, the, in the river. So we have to turn to the sea. And the good news is it's ready for us. So there, there is good news out there. And that co the Villela project just get, makes me feel so good because it means we're going to have, we're going to, I like fish, okay? And now we're going to have fish that's farmed, not wild fish. And as soon as you do that, the wild animals pop back. I mean, w w where I live with 70%, in Nature Conservancy, we have every animal you can imagine. The only thing we're missing, we have, we're missing wolves and uh, elk. We got everything else because we stopped hunting them. It's cool. Valella, and now you're asking a dyslexic to spell the damn word? <laughs> All right. <coughs> I have to close my eyes and visualize it. V-E-L-E-L-L-A. -L -L -A. Valella. That's it. Did it. It's right here when you close your eyes. It's right there. I memorize. I got through college by memorizing my notes. I, th I typed them up because I couldn't read them. I had to type them up right away, and then I just memorized them. Take picture. Is that cheating? <laughs> it's a cheat sheet, isn't? But it's in here. So I got good grades, but my brother was the smartest human being on the planet. So I had to follow an A triple A pluser. And he went to Berkeley in particle physics and. You're Richard's son, brother. You must be. No, you're not. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I think I have the next question. They gave me the mic, so I'm going to ask it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sarah Alexander. I'm the executive director of the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association. So I just want to build off of the conversation, you know, what you were just sharing. Um, we do not, we're not involved uh, directly in aquaculture at the moment. We do certify organic sea vegetables, um, kelp and seaweed, and have been involved in recent conversations about what we can learn from the mistakes that we've made on, on land in farming, um, exactly what you're talking about, and make sure that we're not replicating that with our oceans. Um, so we're not creating the same, you know, destructive practices that we've done on land, which is why we only have 60 harvests left um, in the ocean with, a, with our industrial farming mindset. So I'm curious if you can share a little bit more about um, opportunities that you see to really take sustainability practices um, to the next level with, with any sort of um, farming that we might do in the oceans to really make sure that we, we keep the resources there um, that are there. Well, look at what China's doing. <laughs> they're doing a fantastic job. They're also doing it, uh, their biggest aquacultures on, on carp, on, 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 on freshwater, on land. But I, my, our family has a place over in Blue Hill and right off of where we are, you see all of the oyster farming that they're doing, aquaculture there. So, yeah, uh, I, again, you, want, you don't want to be trying to aquaculture an apex fish. You want to be down and low in the trophic level, uh, and, and, and crustaceans are great, uh, but I, I really like where they're actually flipping fish to being herbivores. And again, they're doing it in a way so you don't see them. You don't have feeding lots where you have this concentration of waste. In fact, in the Hawaiian program, because they're in 12,000 feet of water, when they poop, they get a carbon sequestration credit because it falls to 12,000 feet buttoned up. So very clever. So yes, I, but I'm a geologist. I just don't, don't take me any further than where I am right now. Tomorrow morning, there's a talk, yes. You want to come to tomorrow morning's talk. But yes, there's a hand up here, or maybe someone else was ahead of him, uh, whatever. Ask Allison a question. There we go. I think, are we, are we still doing okay on time, or one more? Okay. I was, I was curious, I was interested in hearing you say something about the deep seabed. Uh, you mentioned that what you're doing is mapping in our exclusive economic zone but I guess it's the deep sea, and then beyond that, there's the deep sea bed, and it's, 
I heard that recently it's become economically viable to extract manganese nodules and things like that. And it seems very concerning, so I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Well, funny you should ask. <laughs> uh, in our orders, you remember I was a, in the Army and the Navy, and when my government gives me orders, I take them seriously. And the orders that we were given by our government were the identical orders that Thomas Jefferson gave Captain Meriwether Lewis and Lieutenant Clark. And that was your purpose is to explore for the economic benefit of our nation. Now, if you flash back to 1806, at the economy of America in 1806, in the North, poor soil, mostly raw materials, uh, fur trading, lots of, uh, of, of, of timber, etc. In the South, you had slavery putting out uh, tobacco and, and uh, cotton, and the Midwestern limited farming. Mostly all raw materials going back to England that they got manufactured and sent back. That was the economy when Lewis, when Jefferson cut the deal with Napoleon for the Louisiana Purchase for $21 million. The, what followed was the complete uh, exploration of the central, mostly the central part, farming, herding, oil and gas, uh, mining, uh, a long, long list that changed the entire economic engine of our nation. So now, here we are. What our Louisiana Purchase is five times larger than the Louisiana Purchase of Jefferson that doubled again, redoubled the size of the United States. So it's a massive amount of real estate. What will that tapestry look like? It'll be a similar tapestry, sanctuaries, farming, herding, mining, and I believe the mining issue, because I'm a geologist, is a really tough one. And in fact, we had what well, we spent all last night with, with uh, 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 S Assistant Secretary, uh, uh, yeah, well, yeah, but her first name, uh, Monica. Um, and we told her about a discovery we made. And I, we're not really in a position to, we made a pretty significant discovery in December with the Nautilus. Of a th uh, th there's three major deposits they're looking at, the black smokers, which I discovered in 79, which are along the mid-ocean ridge, belching out copper, lead, silver, zinc, and gold in what are called uh, polymetallic sulfide deposits, pyrite, calcopyrite, and hydrite, sulfide. That's a big gold rust there. Then you have the manganese nodules that we've known since the Challenger expedition, which are sitting on the abyssal depths. And then the second one is the, the cobalt-rich crusts that have rare earths. And rare earths are critically important to America. They are in every piece of technology you can imagine, from your cell phone to your TV to your fighter pilot to your radar. Every major piece of technology has rare earth. Not a lot, but without it, nothing works. China has a 97% lock on rare earths. So we just made a pretty significant rare earth discovery. And now we're bringing together the warring camps. See, I've always told my students, if you're going to serve society as a scientist, you cannot have a vested interest in the answer. I remember, how many of you saw Dragnet with Sergeant Friday? What did he do? He came to the scene, pulled out his little pad and pencil, licked his pencil and said, just the facts, ma'am. Our job is just the facts. I will not, I can talk to a Republican and I can talk to a Democrat because I'm neither. I'm, I'm right in the middle of that desert where we used to have a lot of people. I'm right down the center. And so I think we've got a winner here. And, but I want to bring out the warring parties and I've got them coming out, and we're gonna say, well, what do you think? Because uh, it's gonna be interesting. I, I think we'll do that live. It's a funded by the Department of Defense, but uh, I think we'll do it live. Watch us, June, isn't it? Watch us, I think I found the solution. That's great. How about that for a tease, huh? I, I, think, I, I think we are and gonna take that, just one more. With that, let's go have a drink, right? Well, okay. Bob, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll just one, one more and then we'll close it out. All right. Hi, my name's Buzz Scott and I'm from Matinicus Island. 
Uh, Bob, I'm a dyslexic as well, and uh, here to, here's to you. Um, Bob Ballard gave me a job a couple of years ago, and Allison let me go out on the ship. I was an ROV pilot, and I was able to uh, help a bunch of those kids that was that were up in that picture earlier uh, learn to fly the ROVs and I wanted to come and stay with you for a long long time but you convinced me that the most important thing about our future is our children and I said you know what he's absolutely right and since then I've come home to Maine and I've, I've taught a bunch of kids about the ocean, about ROVs, about diving into the ocean, and what we need to do to save the future. So I want to thank the both of you for everything you've done for me and everything that I've been able to do for them. It was a pleasure to do it. Wait, you're getting you're getting the standing ovation there. <laughs> so so when that news comes out about those nodules, know that it happened at the Thirsty Whale downtown. That's where that conversation came. Um, like Bob mentioned, tomorrow morning um, at 9.30, we're gonna have a great session dedicated to looking at farming the ocean. Um, Natalie Springle, another uh, COA alum, is gonna lead a group of, of four additional women to talk about aquaculture here on the Maine coast. Um, I wanted to let you know that Rebecca has arrived. I got a text, so the, the boat is, is on, the, the, um, on the pier, which is great. Um, and the thing that struck me the most of, about all this, I have to say, as an educator and as the president of the college, is when Allison Fundus thanked um, Chris Peterson, her adv advisor here. And so I, I, I thought that was really, that hit, that hit here. So that was special. So that's all I'm going to say. Please come back uh, tomorrow at 930. Join us for drinks at the Center for Human Ecology. Bye for now. Thank you.